Good afternoon, everybody. Hi everybody, welcome to our Mondays with Cambridge event. I'm just gonna give you all a few seconds. There are quite a few of you logging on today. So um, I'm just gonna give you all uh, a few seconds to join us. In the meantime, um, for those of you who are joining, if you could just type yes into the chat box if you can hear me okay, that would be wonderful. Fantastic, thank you very much. Lots of you saying yes in the chat box now. Lovely to see you all. Uh, welcome to our Mondays with Cambridge event if you're new and welcome back to those of you who've been to one of our events before. Just before we get started in our very special session today, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping with you. Let's pop myself in the corner out of the way. So at any point during today's session, if you have any problems with your sound or audio, the best thing you can do is just to click that reconnect button at the top, okay? And that will very likely sort your problem. So any sound or audio problems, just click that reconnect button. For anything else, I've got my colleagues who are in the chat box. They're there to help you with any issues you might be having. But do remember for sound, reconnect is your best bet. At the end of the webinar, I know lots of you will be looking for a certificate of attendance. We're gonna share a PDF document with you and that link is there for you to register for your certificate today. And finally, um, at the end of today's session, we're gonna have a little bit of time to put some of your questions to Richard. So please use that chat box also to type any questions. As I said, I've got my colleagues there in the chat box. They'll be noting down your questions for the final 10 minutes or so with Richard. So with great pleasure, I'm just gonna pop myself out of the way. Hello, Richard. Hello, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I am going to introduce Richard now. Richard's joining us from very sunny England. <laughs> Sunnier than Madrid, I think. Um, lovely of you to join us. Thank you so much for being here today, Richard. Uh, it's such a pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. And everyone, thank you so much for coming along. So Richard uh, has been described as one of the most inspirational leaders of his generation. He is an award-winning speaker a best-selling author and world-renowned thinker. Richard's first book, Creating Tomorrow's School Today, has become a go-to text around the world for those involved in the transformation of education. His other books are explorations of human potential, leadership and success. Richard's belief in the importance of soft skills in education is a philosophy that we share here at Cambridge University Press. And personally, something that has been a huge driving force for me in my career, and of course, in the ultimate objective of supporting teachers in Iberia and around the world. It is with great pleasure I welcome Richard Gerber. Richard, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Hello again, everybody. That was a bit like being introduced by my mum. That was uh, wonderful, honestly. I'm a little bit embarrassed. So look, let's get straight on. Let's get straight into what I want to talk about today. Um, and I don't think really we can start any conversation at the moment without spending just a few minutes thinking about uh, and dwelling on the events of the last couple of months. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes exploring the human journeys that many of us have been on by way of setting up the conversation about what we then need to think about for the future for our children, for our education systems, and actually for ourselves. You know, wherever we are in the world, it, it's been the most extraordinary three months. Um, I certainly can't ever remember in my lifetime an experience where the whole world has gone through something like this together. Uh, and I want to share with you six phases of our emotional journey through that process. 
for two reasons. One, because I think it might be really important for us just to think about it. And the second is because in many ways, it's the same six phases we go through whenever we're discussing or thinking about change in any capacity and in any part of our lives. But obviously, after COVID and the crisis we're living through now, that's been uh, more amplified. So let me start with the first phase. And, and as I'm talking, I'd like you all to think a little bit about how many of these things you recognize in yourselves, your, your family, and the people you've been speaking to over the last few months. When this all began, for many of us, when we realized the severity of what was actually happening, and we went into lockdown, and all of the news cycles started to ramp up, as we started to understand what we were dealing with, many of us went into a phase of paralysis. Um, we, we stopped. We couldn't absorb information. We couldn't take anything in. Um, we just froze. Some people, to an extent, became quite manic. I know that I did. I went through that first stage where I just kind of froze and then became completely manic, trying to do anything I could in my power, like, um, like an ab animal scrabbling at a cliff, just trying to gain some sort of control. And after that first phase of paralysis, then most of us experienced a kind of denial, a point where we thought, well, if we turn off the news or we turn off the television or we don't talk to people about this, or if I stick my head in the sand, maybe this will all just go away. And when it doesn't and when it keeps accelerating um, and the change keeps coming and the uncertainty grows, then for many of us, we enter a phase of anger. Uh, we start to blame one another. We start to blame politicians. We start to blame the people we think are breaking the lockdown processes. We blame other countries. Um, I mean, if you want to look at the master of this, we just have to look across the Atlantic to the current leader of the US to see how deeply ingrained in anger some people can become. And then the fourth phase, once we realize that anger isn't doing us any good, is many of us started to feel depressed. We started to feel that sense of listlessness of, I, you know what, I just can't be bothered to get dressed. I can't look forward to anything. I can't seem to find any energy. And in many ways, that's the, the pit of the six stages that we've been through. And what's really interesting is to see how those people that have come out of it have come out of it. And that starts with a kind of exploration, experimentation, where we start to ask questions. We start to dip our toe a little bit and just start to become a little bit more interested in what's going on and what we're living through. And then finally, if we sustain that first step of positivity, that first step where we start to feel some level of control again, we start to head towards an acceptance. And in that stage of acceptance, we become more fully immersed in the constructive, what we can do rather than focusing on what we can't do, rather than focusing on what's happening to us, focusing on what we can actually achieve. And I think in many ways, those six phases uh, mirror and replicate so many things in our lives, including the learning journey. But I think what's really important to recognize is as the world becomes more uncertain, more changeable, as, as the exponential growth and change in society just continues to accelerate as the world turns faster and faster, we have to understand that one of the core purposes now of education is to ensure that both for ourselves and, and maybe perhaps more importantly for our children, we head towards the experimentation and acceptance phase as fast as we can, and that we work with our children as best we can so that they don't feel that the world is happening to them, but they actually have some control over it, which means so much of education has to be focused around that exploration, that experimentation, that ability to accept and to become 
fully immersed, involved, and, and a feeling of control. And I think it's a really important thing as we look towards the future of education to constantly reflect on this idea that the future of education has to be about empowerment and not control. We also have to be very, very careful that what we don't do is keep reacting you know, that kind of desperate scrabbling around in the paralysis stage of change process where we're just looking for any solution, any quick fix. You know, one of the things I think, again, that's been really interesting about the lived experience we've all we've all been through and we all continue to go through is this idea that we just want the solution. What is the answer? Is when's the vaccine coming? Where's the vaccine? Where are the drugs and the antibody, where are these things? Um, and actually the truth is that the process has to be evolutionary. It's nothing happens in one quick step. And that's certainly true of education. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I think we've made over the last 30 or 40 years in education is waiting for the silver bullet, is waiting for the quick solution driven by somebody else to be given to us. And as a result, We've had endless silver bullets, endless new initiatives, endless new ideas, endless promises, none of which have actually de delivered because to some extent they promise something that can't be delivered. You know, the future of education has to be about evolution. There's no such thing as a one day revolution. There's no such thing as a one solution that happens quickly because in many ways, what we've lived through both with COVID, but over a much longer period within the education debate is a rising sense of stress. And one of the things that we know about stress is it happens when we feel a perceived lack of control. People are at their most stressed when we feel we have no control over our lives. And I think we've seen that intensely in the last couple of months, but as educators, we felt it for a very long time. And it's why I believe, going back to my first slide, that idea of driving yourself to explore, to experiment, to try new things out. They don't have to be finished and polished and perfect. You know, one of the great challenges we have as educators is to stop believing we have to be perfect all of the time and realize that we're human beings and that evolution and change in what we do happens as we make mistakes, as we try things and fail and uh, develop them and process them and move them on. And so we mustn't always look for perfection before we start a journey. And maybe that's really the point. Maybe one of the great positives to have come out of our lived experience over the last few months is that it's given us a time to pause a little bit, to reflect, to maybe take a step back. And within education, I think that's where we have to start. We have to start with a new vision for what it is we want our education system to be. And so that's where I want to begin our little journey together this afternoon. I want to spend a few minutes raising and posing some questions that I hope you'll take back and reflect on and share with colleagues as we start to rethink about the way we evolve education. And the person I want to start with is somebody I was fortunate enough to meet in 2018 uh, at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, at a, um, a panel about education. And I want to tell you about a remarkable woman called Manoush Shafiq. Uh, now, for those of you that don't know Manoush, Manoush is one of the world's most celebrated economists. And actually, until very recently, uh, we thought she was going to shatter one of the great glass ceilings in British culture by becoming the first female governor of the Bank of England. Um, sadly, it didn't happen on this occasion, but I'm hoping that the next time the process goes through, she will become uh, the governor of the Bank of England. She's a brilliant, brilliant economist, a brilliant human being and an inspiration. And I want to share with you by way of starting this conversation about vision 
something she said at that conference at the World Economic Forum in 2018. She said that anything is, uh, that's routine or repetitive will be automated. That soft skills, creative skills, research skills, the ability to find information, to synthesize it, to make something of it, are going to be the key components of what we need to do as we develop our young people for the future. That's a challenge, right? This isn't somebody like me saying this, some uh, educator or liberal or creative. This is one of the most powerful and important economists on earth. And then she went on to say something which I think is not only profound, but deeply challenging, because she went on to reflect on the current global state of politics and what we're seeing around the world. And she said, you know, it's no accident that the people who voted for populist parties around the world are people with, by and large, low levels of education. And it's not because they're stupid, it's because they're smart. They figured out that this system will not be in their favor. And I think this is the core to where we have to begin when we start to talk about revisioning the future of education. It's no longer enough to keep developing an education system that just becomes more and more efficient. It's not enough just to do more of what we've always done, but better we actually have to take a step back and explore how we make it different. And again, in so many ways, the experiences of the last few months and before that, the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, have made us realize how uncertain the world is going to increasingly be, how much is going to be beyond our control, how much is going to change. So what we can't do is to continue to create and develop an education system which prepares young people for a life of certainty. Because all that does is feed them a false promise. Uh, and that's why so many people, I think, in the last few years have turned towards populism because they did what they were asked educationally in the workplace. They got their heads down and became as efficient as they possibly could. And then the world started spinning out of control and they became angry because none of what they were promised, stability, came to pass. And so we have to make sure that we're preparing our young people, our children, for a world of constant change. And that means they're going to be have to be more flexible, more curious, more creative, more innovative, more collaborative than ever any generation in the past. They're going to have to be fleet of foot. And maybe, perhaps, they have to be this. The next person I'm going to introduce you to is uh, somebody, again, I had the chance to interview a little while ago, and funnily enough, in Spain, in Madrid. Um, this is Barry Barish. Barry Barish won the 2017 Nobel Prize for Physics for his research into gravitational waves. Now, I'm not a physicist, but he's a really, really clever man. In fact, many people think he's the greatest living scientist. And when I was talking to him, I asked him in particular, about how he built his research team, what kind of human characteristics he was looking for. And he said, you know, that's a really good question. He said, because when we were putting our team together, we had a limited number of places and we had thousands of applicants for people who wanted to be in the team. I said, well, how many, how many places did you have in your research team? He said, ultimately, we had 138 places. I said, and when you say thousands, how many people did you have who actually applied to be in the research team? He said, well, of the serious applicants, and by serious applicants, he meant people with two to three doctoral qualifications in different fields of physics and science. These were the smartest scientists in the world. He said, we had three and a half thousand of those. And I said, well, how did you get it down from three and a half thousand to 138? He said, well, 
we applied two questions. He said the first was this. Nobody got in to our team if they'd only got sciences in their background. He said we needed three-dimensional people. And that meant we needed people with the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. Because people with what just one discipline are no good. They tend to be blinkered. Even when they try to be creative, they're limited by the depths of their own experience. In order to be truly innovative, to be truly curious, to be truly creative, he said, you have to have a much greater three-dimensional experience of the world. And I think that's hugely pertinent as we think about the future of education as educators, as teachers, that no matter what our specialism, whether it's the teaching of English language or not, we have to make sure that we're offering our children constantly and our students three-dimensional views of the world in which they're living so that we are constantly shaping what we're teaching in a wider context because that's how we're going to be able to broaden the talents and skills and abilities and knowledge of our students and children. Now, the second challenge, he said, the second question we applied to those people that applied for positions with us was, I think, one of my favorite things I've ever heard anybody say, and particularly somebody as brilliant as Barry, because he said this. He said, the other thing we were looking for, nobody got onto our team if they didn't have the ability to ask stupid questions. Isn't that great? So just think for a minute about what it takes to have the ability to ask stupid questions. Think about your students. Think about yourselves and how comfortable you are asking the stupid question in your head out loud when you're in a room with your peers or when you're in a room with your students. And just think for a second about what it takes. So maybe one of the other things we need to do as we think about the future of education is how do we ensure we create a culture where our students have the confidence to ask stupid questions? And maybe it starts here. In the casino of learning, you know, I often describe this scenario to people, and I think it's really pertinent now. If you imagine your classrooms as casinos, and you're the croupier, so you are spinning the wheel and rolling the ball. And as your students come into your casino, you're going to be asking them to gamble their self-esteem with you. And so as they walk into your casino, your classroom, they're walking in with a different number of poker chips, each of them. Some of your students, the high rollers, you know, the ones that will answer any question and they bounce back and they don't care if they get it right or wrong. Those students are coming in with hundreds of poker chips of self-esteem. And then there are other students in your group that are coming into your casino with maybe one poker chip. And here's the thing. The ones with hundreds of poker chips of self-esteem aren't necessarily the cleverest. Some of the smartest students in the room could be the ones with the low levels of self-esteem. But here's the problem. As you spin the wheel and roll the ball, as you ask them to engage with you, in the learning process, you're actually asking them to gamble with their self-esteem. You know, the one thing we know about learning is that you learn nothing new by getting something right. You only ever learn something new from the point of a mistake or the realization that you don't know something and you can't do something. And so it takes tremendous courage to learn because learning is tough. Learning means you have to be comfortable and confident enough to expose your weaknesses and your ignorance and what you don't know and what you can't do. 
Now, if you have high levels of self-esteem, that's easy because you throw your poker chips on red or black or odd or even, or even on an individual number. And it doesn't matter if the ball doesn't land where you want it to and you lose because you've got loads of poker chips of self-esteem left. But there's also the student in your room who has the one poker chip, who's sitting in the corner. And it's not that they're badly behaved. It's not that they're ignorant. It's not that they don't want to play the game. It's just they're sat there looking at the game thinking, this is a great game. I would love to play this game. But I've only got one poker chip of self-esteem. And if I put it on red and it comes up black or odd and it comes up even, I've got nothing left. And so one of the other challenges we have got to think about as educators is that if we're going to ensure we create generations of students who have the confidence to ask stupid questions, we have to have generations of students that have enough self-esteem and resilience to be able to fail so that they truly can engage in the learning process. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is a reflection from this organization, the OECD. Now, most of us know this organization as the organization who produced the international league tables every couple of years, the PISA international league tables. You know, the ones that our politicians and our media bash us with as educators as they tell us how bad we are at what we do. Well, the tragedy is that actually... The OECD produced some really, really interesting research that politicians and many people in the media are far too lazy to actually read. And in 2013, they produced a visionary document about the future of education called the Skills Outlook. And it was the first global report of its type to ask the questions about the links between education, employment and skills. And I think the findings were profound. And I want to share with you now the four key headline findings from that report in 2013. Now, in order to get the findings, the OECD interviewed some of the world's largest employers, some of the most important educators, teachers all over the world. They interviewed parents. They interviewed universities. They interviewed everybody who had a stake in the future for our young people. And here were the four key headlines. Think about how much this might resonate in Spain, in Iberia, in your context. Firstly, that the countries where there was an over-reliance on formal qualifications in the education system, in the acquisition of formal qualifications, rather than the development of actual skills, were the countries where young people were going to find it increasingly difficult to get work. Just think about that for a moment, because the problem with most of the world's most developed education systems is they're almost all entirely designed and focused on preparing children to gain qualifications. And we all know as educators what that means. We focus on those things not because we believe in them, but because that's where the pressure is put on us. So one of the great challenges of courage for us as a profession moving forward is to ensure that we don't focus purely on pre uh, preparing our children to gain formal qualifications at the expense of the other things they need. And at the top of that list of other things they need is the next headline in this OECD report that young people will need higher levels of interpersonal skills than any previous generation. Whereas 50 or so years ago, where most companies were focused on productivity, the premium uh, quality that companies were looking for in their future employees were routine cognitive skills, the ability to re uh, remember core information, to be te technically efficient, and to be able to repeat and reproduce that over and over again. Well, in 2013, the OECD report very clearly found that by 
far the most important quality young people could come out of education with were interpersonal skills. And to that end, the third headline, that it's vital that people can learn, adapt, and change. So again, when we're thinking about how we prepare and deliver learning in classrooms, just having a passive environment where we're telling our students information or giving them stuff is not enough. We need to create learning environments which are rich not just in learning, but are constantly requiring our students to adapt and to change and to self-lead and self-manage. And then the final headline is this one that there have to be closer links between the worlds of work and education. Now, I know the argument, and as an educator passionately believe, that education should be first and foremost, first and foremost about the joy and love and, of learning. But if we're honest, mass education can't just be about that. It can't just be a celebration of the cerebral, of the academic. It has to be functional. And one of the primary responsibilities of every educator in any facet of education is to prepare our students to not just survive, but thrive in their future. And that means we have to prepare them as rounded, full human beings. And that leads me to this. When I wrote my last book last year, Education, a Manifesto for Change, there were five things for me that I think we have to focus on when we're thinking about three-dimensional education of our young people. And I think where possible, no matter what we teach, we need to be trying to include aspects of these things in all of our learning and all of our teaching. So we need our students to understand what it means to be healthy. Wow, how much more relevant is that now today than it was even three months ago? We have to ensure that our young people are developed in a skilled way. They develop skills and knowledge and attributes. That they become fully aware of the world around them, not just their immediate world, but the wider global context in which they live. That we have to ensure in education, we develop in them a sense of optimism, of hopefulness, and again, that's never been more important now, has it, as we return to some form of normal than it ever has been. And as we think about readmitting our students back into the education journey, that almost for me, that has become the primary quality and qualification of the first stage of learning. How do we ensure that we help our young people and our learners truly see the world still as a hopeful and optimistic place to be? And then finally, that we're helping them develop an awareness of their world so that they can see that they are all of value, no matter what their skills, no matter what their interests, no matter what their background, no matter whether they have special educational needs or whether they are high-flying academic students, that they all understand that they have a crucial role to play as emerging citizens. And when they leave education, they all have a profound sense that they are of value. And so at this point, I want to share with you my cycle for what I think learning should look like. For me, the purpose of what we do is about developing in our children a love of learning and of life. That education is primarily about those things, about helping them understand actually how learning has a power and connection to the quality of the lives they can lead and to celebrate the potential of the lives they can lead. Secondly, to do that, that we have to focus on ensuring they have the skills and the knowledge to drive that learning and that celebration of life forwards. And then comes the real challenge, because in order to do that as educators, to make the learning matter, we have to ensure that the learning is applied in contexts. So in other words, we can't just teach children abstract ideas and tell them that one day they'll understand or one day it'll be important. 
We have to find out a way to make sure that the learning matters in the moment. And in many ways, people who teach English language or languages are some of the best in the world at this because just teaching the technicalities of a language will never embed a language for students. The way to do it is to, to create immersion, right? To create an environment where you're teaching that language in a real context. And that has to be the core of our process. And also that that learning has to be rich in experience. So that again, if we're asking our students to learn English, we're uh, getting them to role play and do it in environments which will really hook them and mean something to them as they come out of that learning journey. And in a way, that leads to the fourth stage of the cycle, which I think in many ways is the core philosophy of what it means to be an educator. We have to ensure that in everything we're doing, we're helping to develop in our students a sense of aspiration. And an aspiration for me is that ability to have a dream. And then the aspiration is by building the rungs on a ladder that make that dream tangible, a real possibility. And the rungs on the ladder are how we fit as educators into that young person's journey. Because if that young person, say, wants to be a pilot or a ballerina, what we have to do is then help them understand the steps on the ladder they need to take in order to get there. And those steps on the ladder are learning. And also coming back to the fifth of the qualities I just talked about, we have to make sure that in everything our, we do, our students feel that sense of value and purpose for themselves, for their families, for their local communities and globally. Now I want to just move on. We've got maybe uh, 10 more minutes. So I want to tell you a couple of stories that I just hope really galvanize that sense of vision and the challenge we must set ourselves. And the first is to talk about uh, another meeting. In fact, the last two stories I'm going to tell you are about two meetings with two of my heroes. The first happened a few years ago and was with the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak who I got to work with in Saudi Arabia a few years ago. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go uh, because it was Saudi Arabia and because of some of the political complexities around going to Saudi Arabia. But when they told me that I could have five minutes alone with Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, one of my heroes, the man who actually built and designed the first Apple computers, I couldn't not go. And so I went and I asked him a couple of questions. Um, I blew it at first, by the way, because I was so awe struck when I first met him. Nothing came out of my mouth. But I then got to spend time with him, funnily enough, on the plane from Riyadh to London. And I got the chance to ask him a couple of things about his experience of the world. And two things he said to me, I think, were really important. The first was this. He said, you know, Richard, when we debate the vision and future for education, I think we get stuck too often in a debate around what we should teach our students. And he said, actually, what's really important is not what they learn, but how they learn, because the future is about a change in knowledge and skills and attributes. It's never about fixed knowledge, skills and attributes. Which led on to the second thing he said, because he said to me, you know, that really became clear to me when Steve Jobs and I first realized we were going to have to hire people to join us in the Apple team. He said we went out for a beer one night to talk about the kind of people we were looking for. And he said there's an awful lot of rubbish written about Steve Jobs. But he said that night when we were talking about the kind of characteristics we wanted from the people we were going to hire, he said, you know, if we're going to make this company work, was we can't hire just clever people. We need something more than that. Because if all we do is we hire efficient, academic, clever people, all we'll keep doing is perfecting what we've always done. And if this company is going to survive long into the future, 
It can't make the same thing over and over again. We have to give the world stuff it doesn't know it needs yet. And in order to do that, we need a different kind of person. And so that night they came up with a mantra or a promise. And it must really work because Apple still use it today as a core philosophy when they're looking at hiring new people. And the promise was this, you know, so beautifully Apple, so simple and elegant on the outside. But when you take off the surface, it's so complicated underneath. And again, I think it's a real challenge for us to think about as we move forward into the future and we think about the kind of characteristics we need to develop in our young people. Because the promise was this one. They said, at Apple, we will never employ anyone who needs managing. Now, as I skip through a few of the slides, because I've run out of time and I sadly need to get to my big finish, I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about what that actually means to actually be able to create generations of students who don't need managing. Now, in a way, that's a core challenge for us as teachers, because what we can't do is train them to be reliant on us or other people to solve their problems for them. And that takes me back a little bit to where I started this afternoon with the crisis. Because in some ways, so many of us were paralyzed because we've been waiting for other people to find all of the solutions to all of the problems that we've been dealing with. Now, on the whole, we have to rely on scientists and politicians for sure in the crisis we're in right now. But also we had to have greater confidence to control the controllable things, the things that were in our power to change and to manipulate so that somehow we found our way through navigating the challenges we face. And that really is a metaphor for our lives moving forwards. We can't just rely on other people to do it for us. We have to find ways to manage ourselves and we have to make sure that as educators, we help our young people to find ways to manage themselves better. And for me, that requires a number of things. One, it's the vision. Two, we have to be wedded to a greater sense of collaboration and professional generosity. For too long around the world, I've seen educators expend far too much of their time polarized, trying to argue with each other intellectually about who's right and who's wrong. We need to come together under that vision and share our experience and knowledge and skill and judgment. We need great teaching, not just okay teaching, not just people at the front of a classroom, but teachers who truly understand how to create those deep emotional connections with our students, where trust is at the heart of everything we do, because it's the trust that allows our students to feel comfortable enough to make mistakes, to fail, and to ask the stupid questions. We need to perpetuate a spirit of optimism, of, as I've said before, more now than ever. We need to remember that love is at the heart of what we do. It's why we get up every morning to do what we do with the students in our care. It's why so many of us have missed them so badly over the last few months. We have to ensure that our students feel that sense of, of belonging and of value. And finally, we have to understand that what we invest in our students today will be the legacy we leave for them and future generations for tomorrow. And on that point, I want to leave you with my mic drop moment, the greatest moment of my professional life. You know how most of us have lists of heroes, people or famous people or whatever, people we'd love to meet in our fantasy dinner party or before we die. Well, again, funnily enough, some of the best things that have ever happened to me in my professional life have happened in Madrid. And a couple of years ago in Madrid, I got to meet the number one person on my list. And I want to share with you something they said to me that day that I hope resonates as we wrap up the presentation and maybe move into a couple of questions. 
because that person was him. And there's a couple of things I want to share with you about this picture before I tell you what we talked about. The first is, look how happy he is to see me. Look at the smile on his face. Isn't that wonderful? And secondly, I want you all to notice how many chins a beard hides. That photo was the reason why I decided to grow a beard. And I think it's working. Anyway, back to what really matters. I got the chance to ask him about what he'd learned most from his time in the White House. And he said this to me, and it's the thought I'm going to leave you with. He said, you know, Richard, when I first started in the White House, I believed that most of the problems that crossed my desk, and just think about that for a moment, the problems that crossed his desk. He said, when I think about most of the problems that crossed my desk, I thought most of them would, would be technical. He said, but when I reflect on my eight years in the White House, what I realize is this. Virtually none of the problems I had to deal with were technical by nature. They were human. They were about love, ha hatred, anger, greed, jealousy, tribalism, politics, trust. And as he spoke, I thought to myself, you know, the same thing is true about education. Maybe we have spent too long focusing on the technical and not enough on the human. And if there's anything we can learn from the lived experience of the last few months, it's this. What really, really matters above anything to all of us is humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. I was so immersed <laughs> there that I almost forgot to turn my camera back on. Thank you so much. And just while you take a moment, a little breather there, Richard, I am going to throw some questions your way in a second. But I just wanted to kind of let you know some of the feedback we've been getting in on the chat no. box. I know that you haven't been focusing on that. It's very distracting for a speaker. Um, but don't worry, that's why the Cambridge team are there. We've been paying attention to all of the comments and the questions. So to start off with, Richard, just to let you know, just two or three of these amazing comments that have been coming up. Um, from Carmen Vicente, um, says, she says, it's great before I start my class today. Thanks for the inspiration, which is lovely. Um, from Maria Teresa, he is really inspiring. I want to be like him when I am old. <laughs> I thought you might like that one, Richard. I thought that might give you a giggle. And um, we can imagine that Maria Teresa must well, be eighteen obviously, or nineteen. Because, you know, uh, only being thirty-ish, you know. Ex ex yeah, exactly. And also, I think this is from the same person. Um, she says, "If if you're able to tell us so much in just forty-five minutes, I wonder how much we could learn from a long conversation." Which I, I, I wanted to end the comments on that one because it's pretty much how I felt as well during that session. That. 45 minutes just flew by and I was so immersed, like so many people there, um, leaving great comments in the chat box. But for some questions for you, please, Richard, if you wouldn't mind. Of course. First of all, the the kind of, um, the idea of these stupid questions mm -hmm. um, was something that kind of raised lots of chat in the chat box. People saying, what defines a stupid question? And um, there are no stupid questions. I'm sure you'll agree with everybody there, Richard. But um, Buana is, is saying people may be afraid to ask dumb questions because of peer pressure. There might be like lack of self-confidence. Um, and that kind of leads me on to these two questions from Sabrina, who's saying, how can, how can we create that culture of asking stupid questions? And Luthia, who asks, what can we do to make the most of introverted, sorry, introverted students um, so that they feel confident enough to ask those types of questions? Well, I think those are two incredibly powerful and, and really perceptive questions, actually. Um, firstly, the, the first of those two points, I think what's really important is not to underestimate our power as educators, as role models. And often when we talk about role models, we kind of think we have to be constantly upright, you know, showing the, the really positive behaviors that we need to show. And, and that's not wrong. 
But what's really important is to remember that we as role models need to show our own vulnerability sometimes, our own fears sometimes. We need to be prepared to make mistakes because I think sometimes as educators, we feel under pressure to be perfect and to be right all of the time, to be the carriers of knowledge and wisdom. And there are some educators who I know feel very nervous about exposing that they don't know something or they can't do something. And I understand that because of the profound pressure as educators and scrutiny that we're under so much of the time. But I think you, the ability, do not underestimate the power of making mistakes and asking dumb questions to your students can be because that'll give that creates the climate and the culture to allow them to do the same thing. And in many ways, that's the point. You know, one of the things that you, you look at when you research the environments in the world where those stupid questions lead to some of the world's most dramatic innovations. Google, for example, is a wonderful case in point as, a, as, a, as a, um, an organization, as an office space. You know, one of the things they focus on is developing a culture of psychological safety. That ability to know and trust everyone in the room around you has your back that nobody's going to judge you for what you say or how you say it, which allows people to be more honest. You know, we all know environments as educators and remember environments when we were students where we would be intimidated about saying, I don't understand or I don't know, because we knew we were being judged by the people around us. So I think that's the first point. Create the culture by being the role model. And the second point about introversion, I think, is another really important one. And often it goes back very powerfully to the point about the poker chips. You know, some of our most brilliant students are deep introverts and they are brilliant, but they're only holding the one poker chip of self-esteem. And so in many ways, it's about varying the way you manage and run that classroom. It's making sure that you know who those students are and you quietly go up to them at the right point. You don't put them in the spotlight. You don't say, right now, Jose, it's your turn to answer the question. You, you might go up to them after the, the main complex, you know, the Q&A in the room and say, what do you think? What are you? And or maybe before you do a big Q&A, you go up to them and you say, what, what's your answer? What, what question have you got? And they they tell you and you say to them, all right, well, would you be happy to share that now with the rest of the room? And if they say no, you say, well, would you mind if I shared it on your behalf? So as much as possible, it's about making sure those people know they have a voice in a culture of, of emotional and psychological safety without ever feeling threatened. And what you'll find is that as you perpetuate and develop those skills and thoughts in those students, they'll probably be more and more prepared to share in that public domain because what you're doing is building their little bag of poker chips of self-esteem. Fantastic. Another question from Elizabeth. How can we encourage students to be aware of their active role in this new reality? I thought that was okay. a really interesting one for right now. I, th I think it absolutely is. And actually, I think in many ways, by you, know, one of the things we all need to do in this new reality, although it sounds like a hackneyed phrase already, in this new reality, is rather than just jumping straight back into the teaching of the content and the syllabus we have to teach right now, I think as educators in wherever we are, wherever we're based and whoever the students are we're working with, is actually to take some time, like I did with you at the beginning, just to reflect on the lived experience. Because I think by reflecting, you know, if all we do is we gloss over and go back to normal too quickly, it means we may not have learned anything as individuals from the experience we've lived through. And I think it's really important that we try where we can to find the constructive in what we've lived through. And by talking about it, by reflecting on it, by talking about the need for self-responsibility, self-awareness and self-leadership, this could be a really powerful time to have that talk conversation about the development of self-leadership and self-management and, and self-responsibility. And from Melissa, I suppose a more general question now. How do we help students develop a sense of purpose for something that they don't think is important? 
Well, again, for me, the, the biggest lesson that I ever learned about this was when I observe uh, children in early years education learning. You know, there's no accident. Many experts will tell us that we learn somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of everything we learn in our lifetime before we're five. You know, the human learning graph kind of goes from this to this to this until we die when it's kind of depressingly here. Um, and one of the reasons why young children learn so fast is because so much of that learning is immersive and experiential. And one of the sad things as we get older is we turn learning more into a um, transactional process teacher imparting knowledge to student. And so what happens is as students, they become more reliant on that passive way of learning. Rather than being active learning, active learners, rather than being engaged immersively, they sit back and they wait for us to tell, up, tell them what's of value, what's important, what we should know, how we should know it, and how we prove it. So all I can suggest is, you need to make your lessons and your teaching as experiential as possible. So I suppose, pardon me, one example from my own background was when I was the head of the school I was at in Grange in, in, in the UK many years ago, we had to teach languages and we taught French and we taught Spanish. But rather than teach them just in classrooms, we actually created our own cafe where the children could go in, sit at tables, order drinks, have food. But the catch was the waiters and waitresses who were other children wouldn't serve them in that restaurant unless they spoke in the language of the day. So some days the language in the cafe was French. Some days the language in the cafe was Spanish. But what that did would gave those students immediate purpose to learn a language and also then to practice it in, a, in an experiential way. And of course, what you find is students become far more hooked and involved because they can see the value, particularly for students who are children. One of the things we know is they don't deal with the abstract very well. So just saying to them, you know, this will be really important when you're in your 20s or 30s because it'll give you the chance to get a job in an international organization. Well, you know, to a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old, that's meaningless. So you have to make them the learning matter now. Fantastic, Richard. I'm sure we could we could have sat here for another hour or two, I think, with all of the questions that are coming in. But sadly, that's all we have time for. Um, we'll be back to say goodbye in a little bit. But for now, thank you so much, Richard. And on behalf of everybody there in the chat box and my colleagues at Cambridge University Press, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. See you in a minute. So just before we go, guys, just to give you um, some ideas, we're going to give you um, access to a PDF in a second. And on that PDF, you're going to have some links to our Cambridge Live Competencies Framework. Um, lots of things that Richard has been talking about today. You can find our framework that ties really, really well to that. Remember, at the beginning, I said very much in line with the philosophy we have at Cambridge University Press and our learning journey. And of course, if you don't know, our Cambridge in CASA site has lots of resources for students, parents, and of course, teachers. So go check that out if you haven't already. Um, your certificate, you can register. Again, we'll pop this link. It'll be in the PDF, okay? So don't worry, you don't have to note this down now. It will be in the PDF that I believe my colleagues, thank you very much, are sharing with you now. So you can register for your certificate there. And, um, a comment from Bleona. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, but Bleona said, I want to spend all my mon uh, Mondays with Cambridge, which is fantastic to hear. Thank you so much. You're enjoying. It's great to hear that you're enjoying our, our series of Mondays with Cambridge events. And next week, sadly, will be our final one. But we do have the incredible Ed Fido, co-founder of School 21 with us for this very final event. Um, for Mondays with Cambridge, so don't miss it. And it just leaves me to once again say thank you so much to Richard. A final comment for you, Richard. I thought you'd like this one um, from Carmen. She says that she doesn't go to concerts and she doesn't have favorite actors or singers, but Richard Gerber rocks, inspiring the person I want a selfie with. <laughs> Oh, well, listen, tell Carmen that I promise that the next time I'm allowed to visit and if she is ever in the same room as me, I promise we'll have a photo together. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much once again, Richard. Thank you to everybody who's attended today. Take care and see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.